Yeah, right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What? Oh, not okay. So, and about lockdown? How about you? Yeah, yeah, your university is okay? In my university, the COVID-19 is okay. But... Uh -huh. Work from uh, home, right? But in Indonesia, no, in Medan is increasing. Because oh, so yeah, many yeah. Uh, people are coming. I'm not see you. Where is your face? <laughs> and right. <laughs> next good time, next time. Okay, that's good. Uh, okay. Professor Fabian Lim also in here. Okay, okay. Thank you, Mr. Faisal. Oh, that's good. Ah, not yep. oh, so I'm good. here. Yeah. So uh -huh. we'll definitely have a lecture, don't worry. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yep. Okay. Yep. Still waiting. Yep, no worries. Yep. Yeah. Oh, no, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tadi itu aku baru foto, di foto in di sana. Fia, okay. You can begin. Bisa dimulai. Yes, Miss. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. The Dean Sports Science Faculty, the Fish Dean Academic Associate, Professor Dr. Mahalul Azam, the Staff for Sports Science. Department Assistant Professor Sugiarto, MSc. This lecture, Professor Fabian Lim, Moderator Associate, Professor Sri Sumatiningsi, PhD, and all participants from UNES, UNDIP, and other universities. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I'm Via Fitriani. It's a precious chance to be your master of ceremony on this special occasion, guest lecture in exercise physiology. Alhamdulillah, today's sports science department FIK UNES 
has a special event guest lecture in exercise physiology by Associate Professor Fabian Chin Leong Lim, PhD, under the topic Thermoregulation and Heat Tolerance. The several agenda for this activity, the first agenda, opening speech of guest lecture by Association Professor Dr. Mahalul Azam, Magister Kesehatan. The second agenda, moderator session by Association Professor Sri Sumartiningsi, PhD, introduction moderator of Sri Sumartiningsi by MC. The third agenda, introduction guest lecture association, Professor Fabian Chin Leong Lim, PhD, by moderator. The fourth agenda, guest lecture presentation. The five agenda, discussion, question and as well. The last agenda, closing, giving certificate and taking picture together. Okay, we're going to first agenda opening speech of guest lecture by Associate Professor Dr. Mahalul Azam, Magister Kesehatan. Time is yours. Thank you, uh, Master Serimani, Saudara Via, Via Fitiani. Uh, okay, Honorable our guest lecture, Professor Fabian Lim, PhD from uh, Nanyang Technology University Singapore. Welcome to Universitas Negeri Semarang, Professor. I think it's uh, several time you uh, become our uh, guest lecturer. And we are thank very, you. thank you very much. Yeah, we are very thanks for your uh, willingness to accept our request to be our uh, guest lecturer. Thank you. Yeah. And moderator, Gusti uh, Sumartini CPSD, thank you also. You designed this uh, program uh, well, so uh, today we can, uh, we will discuss uh, with Professor uh, Fabian. And all of uh, participants from Universitas Negeri Semarang, as well as from other university. I think we recognize from Universitas Ponegoro, from the yeah, other university that joined this uh, class today. We welcome. Uh, we represent our uh, Ian, Prof. Tanbio, that uh, right now uh, cannot uh, join this this, uh, this lecture because Prof. Tanbio have uh, to examine the final project in the dissertation. So. Uh, she sent her warm regard to all of you, especially to Prof. Fabian, uh, because uh, Prof. Tanjo cannot uh, join by herself here. And uh, yeah, we are very uh, lucky here. With, uh, we have Professor Fabian that will deliver the exercise physiology in the topic of thermoregulation and heat uh, tolerance. I think it's very uh, interesting uh, topic to be discussed. And I'm sure that uh, we will get the uh, benefit from this discussion and get knowledge uh, from uh, Prof. Fabian. Uh, I know Prof. Fabian is very, very uh, expertise uh, in this in this uh, topic. I think uh, that's all from uh, Fakultas Ilmu Kelurgaan. We thank again to all of you, especially to Prof. Fabian and to all of you enjoying the uh, today's discussion. And thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay. Uh, yeah. And, uh, we'll going the. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mazalul Azam, for the speech. We'll going the second agenda moderator session by.
Asosiat Profesor Sri Sumartiningsi, PhD. Oke, okay. name Sri Sumartining Si. Date of birth, uh, 1993. Home address, Telogo Mukti Timur 3, 901 RT 02 RW 26, Perum Graha Mukti, Semarang, Indonesia, 50196. Kontak Sri Sumartiningsi at gmail.com or... Uh, Affiliation, Faculty of Sports Science, Universitas Negeri Semarang, NIP 132-308-389, or 198309-182-005-012-003, NIDN 001-809-83-01. Pangkat atau jabatan 4A atau lektor kepala. Address Office, Jalan Raya Sekarang, Gunung Pati, Semarang, Indonesia, 50229. Kontak Sri Sumatiningsi at gmail UNES ACID. Degree University, Bachelor of Science, Universitas Negeri Semarang, Sport Science, uh, tahun 2000 sampai 2004. Master, Master of Health Science, Airlangga University, Surabaya, Basic Medical Science, tahun 2007 sampai 2019. Doktor of Philosophy, China Culture University, Sport Coaching Science, Master, tahun 2013 2019. Awards, M. Organis, Yar, Yong, Investigator Awards VOTS Taiwan tahun 2011 uh, Achievement of Best Lecture UNES Indonesia tahun 2011 Indonesia Sport Performance Academy NIVS Hanoyo Japan 2019 Young Educator Travel Awards VAOPS Kobe Japan 2019 Application and Manuskrip in okay. no, need, no need to read all. Okay, thank you. Yeah. No okay, finish. Yeah. Okay, Fia. Thank you very much for your introduction of me. So, okay, today. We are, thank you, Fia, and thank you very much, Professor, Associate Professor Mahalul Azam, for opening speech. And thank you very much, Professor, Associate Professor Fabian Lim. Also in here, we have special guys from Thailand, Marisa, Mrs. Marisa, also from Pakistan, Mr. Faisal Abbas, and we have also from UNJ, Uh, another university, UNDI, UNJ, UNIMED, also in here. So not only from UNES. Um, okay. So this is third time for Professor Fabian have giving guest lecture about exercise physiology. First is about fail to mix. And then second is about lactate threshold. And this is the third about thermoregulation and heat stroke. So this is have, will be have two part. This is one part and then second part will be on 17th of May. Um, okay, so Professor Fabian, the curriculum vitae, he's a, now associate professor of exercise physiology 
in program director graduate diploma in sport medicine in school Likong Chian School of Medicine Nanyang Technological University since 1st July 2014 and uh, his for PhD is from in kinesiology in exercise physiology and immunology in University of Queensland 2003 until 2006 and now she has so many publications in the high ranking of journal in Q1. And the last, his publication about the, about his work also in this topic, the I'm sorry, in the environmental and public health. International Journal in Environmental and Public Health. I think in the scopus impact factor is 2.8. And he also have high ranking in high index about 15. So we need in here, we need collaboration, how to make a good research, how to collaborate also, also good publication. And before before that, thank you. And Professor Fabian, are you ready? Now the time is yours. Uh, thank you, Associate Professor Tintin. Thank you very much for organizing this seminar and the uh, pleasure of speaking to everyone again. It's really ha I'm really happy to be back. Um, thank you, Professor Azam, and good to see you again, Professor Rauhu. Yep. Um, it's really a pleasure to be back. Um, I was afraid that after the last two lectures that I won't be invited back again. <laughs> so this time around, um, when Tintin asked me to speak, I, I chose a topic which is my favorite topic. Um, can I share the slide now, Tintin? Yes, yes, yeah, of okay. course. Yeah. Okay, can you? Uh, yeah, I got it. <clears throat> Can everyone see my slide? Yes. Okay, clear. good. Yeah, good. Let me put it up. Okay. Yeah. Put it here. Okay. Oh, no. Yeah, that's the one. All right. So the topic I've chosen uh, today has to do with thermal regulation and heat tolerance. And this is a topic that I spend a large part of my research life in. Uh, when I came back from University of Oregon after finishing my master's degree, uh, there was only one job in Singapore that had employees and exercise physiologists, and that's in the military. Um, so I, I joined the military as a researcher. I was the first human science researcher in the Singapore Armed Forces as part of the medical corps, and that was in 1991. And the first problem they thrown to me to solve was heat injury. And, you know, I've learned nothing. I, I was never taught heat injury in my university. Um, but because of the importance of understanding how temperature regulation works in us, and because of the weather that we live in, in Singapore, and I'm, I'm sure in Indonesia, in Thailand, in Pakistan as well, uh, heat is very much a part of our life. Um, and so that became a research relationship over 30 years, uh, such that when I went to do my PhD um, at the University of Queensland. My thesis was on the, the mechanisms of heat stroke. And I even developed a new model to explain heat stroke. Um, and so this is something I'm very comfortable with. And the, the, there are two main reasons why I think it's important for me to share the information with you. And that's because uh, Heat injury temperature regulation is something that's in the literature for more than 300 years. And a lot of the information that's being taught today, even in medical schools in, you know, all over the world, including Singapore, are still teaching concepts that are no longer relevant. Um, and that's because there are lots of new information in the research domain that has not been updated 
uh, in the way, in the information that we give to the public, in what we teach uh, to students. And so what I hope to do uh, through the two-part lecture is to bring to you, firstly, some basic understanding on the concepts of how our body regulates temperature. Um, and then the second part will talk about heat injury. Okay, so some of the things you're going to hear about will be very controversial. I'll be telling you that if you were to drink too much, uh, if you were to if you were to be dehydrated versus overhydrated, it's very difficult to die when you're dehydrated, but it's much easier to die when you're overhydrated. I'll be telling you that maybe there's no such thing as heat exhaustion, something that has been taught for the last few hundred years. You know, one of the heat injuries called heat exhaustion. I'll be sharing with you information about to, to suggest to you that perhaps there's no such thing as heat, heat exhaustion. And I'll also be sharing with you information that perhaps heat stroke is due to something else and not to heat. So these are the, 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 the concepts I hope to share with you uh, in the next two, two in, in, in two parts, like in the next two lectures uh, today and next Monday. And I hope that you, know, you come back for the second part after today. Um, I listed here in my slide the two references. One I just published uh, last year, and another one I published in 2018. Uh, most of the information that I, I'm going to share with you today and next Monday uh, uh, can be found in these two publications. These are major reviews that I, I wrote and published in the last few years. Um, the one in antioxidant is on heat stroke, and the one in uh, International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health is on temperature regulation and, and global warming. How can we, how do we understand temperature regulations in human in the context of global warming? Uh, each one of them took me close to nine months to write. So, <laughs> um, you know, if you have time, uh, you know, I highly recommend that you read them. Okay. Now, we are in the midst of this thing called COVID-19. And one of the constant thing that we hear in COVID-19 is how many people get infected every day. Uh, how many people get, uh, uh, you know, die of COVID-19 every day. But I'm going to share with you some information to suggest to you that if environmental temperature goes above a certain threshold, the effects on, the, on public health will be as bad as COVID-19, if not worse than COVID-19. So this was the one of, no, heat waves has been happening in the world since the, you know, recorded in the literature since the 1960s. Um, and each time when it happened, thousands of people would die. Okay. And in this case, I'm just showing you one of the worst heat waves that has taken place in Europe. And this was in the summer of 2003. Over a span of, um, to about three months when, when temperature went up to about 40 degrees across, across Europe, mainly due to the effects of El Nino, uh, there were about 34,000 people who died. And these are from the countries as I just showed you uh, in the slide in, on the left-hand side of the slide in front of, in front of you. Uh, there are, I believe that this is underreported because there are, there are other countries in Europe where the data is not included in this. If you were to include the data of, uh, of uh, other countries in Europe, the number here, I believe, would be double what you see. It would be closer to 100,000 over three months. All right. 2010, uh, Moscow in Russia uh, actually had a period of heat wave uh, uh, during the summer as well. If you look here, the daily high temperature went up to 38 degrees Celsius. Uh, in our region, Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, usually our daily temperature is between 33, 32 to about 35 degrees Celsius. Uh, in this case, it went up to 38 degrees Celsius when their normal temperature during that period is about 24 degrees Celsius. And you're looking at about 700 people dying every day. In 10 days, you get 7,000 people dying. This, is, this death rate right, is higher than COVID-19. So the thing with heat stroke, you've got to understand is this. We seldom hear of heat stroke, but when heat stroke takes place, it, can, it is very lethal. The lethality is very high and the impact can be very wide in public health. Uh, the worrying thing is that since the last 10 years in Southeast Asia region, uh, the, the frequency of heat wave 
Heat wave is a period when, when, when environmental temperature is very high. The frequency of heat wave uh, is becoming more and more uh, reported across, across Southeast Asian region and across Asia region as a whole. Um, and this is what this is saying is that our region itself is heating up. Okay. And this is uh, just in 2000, let me see, 2013, where heat wave killed three in Japan and hospitalized uh, 2,500 people across Japan. Uh, in the same year, uh, you also get people dying and a high hospital rate in Korea, uh, in, in China as well, in Beijing. Uh, this was a heat wave again the following year in Japan. Uh, and it killed 15 people and, and there were 8,000 people, yeah, 8,000 were hospitalized in the same heat wave. Uh, and and <laughs> the, the period when heat wave takes place uh, in our home is now, May, June, July. This is the hottest part in our part of the world, in Southeast Asia, North, North Asia, and so on. And so this is actually a good time to be talking about heat and heat injury, all right? Um, in uh, this is in uh, let me see 2015 I think yeah um, uh, you know there was a, a a large heat wave in India as well and up to that point this was May uh, 2015 uh, there were 1,000 people 1,300 people who died of of heat stroke right um, also in the same year heat wave killed about 200 people in Pakistan and in Karachi alone in the same year this is just few weeks ago. Uh, the 1,300 was in May. In Pakistan, was reported in June. About 700 people were died, have died of heat wave, uh, heat stroke uh, in Karachi as well. So this is it. I think a lot of us, because we operate, many of us operate in air-conditioned environment, and we operate in an enclosed environment, uh, we forget that heat is something that can kill, and not only can kill, but can kill in a very wide form. Uh, and this impact not just in sports in physical education, it affects people who work in outdoor as well. Uh, laborers who have to work in a farm, who has to work, you know, do construction work, uh, people who have to do, uh, military people who have to you know, train and operate in wearing very thick uniform, uh, carrying heavy loads. Uh, they are all exposed to the risk of heat injury. And, you know, uh, but so what I want to share with you really is the, the understanding of temperature regulation. How does our body protect ourselves from heat injury? How does our body regulate temperature? And how do we then take advantage of that to prevent heat injury? So there are two parts to my title. The first part is, uh, sorry. The first part is temperature regulation. Uh, and the second part is heat tolerance. And I want to differentiate the two. Temperature regulation refers to the sum of physiological rep, uh, uh, responses that are activated to maintain homeostasis of body temperature. So just like your heartbeat, right? Your heart has to beat 24 hours a day. Your brain has to regulate, our brain has to regulate our temperature 24 hours a day as well, whether we are sleeping or we are awake. Okay, because that's part of metabolism as well. Okay, so throughout the day, our body temperature is regulated to maintain within a certain range. And the reason that we're being we're able to do that is because uh, the brain functions to maintain temperature in that range, just like our heart rate. The, the, the heart is regulated to beat so many beats a minute when we're not exercising. It's the same concept. And if this system breaks down, then we go into a, 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 we go into a state of illness, right? Okay, so just like when we get a fever, when you get a fever, that's when our temperature regulation uh, be, go into a state of dyshomeostasis, right? Okay, now the other term that is related to temperature regulation is sometimes mixed up with the idea of temperature regulation or heat stress. Is this idea of heat tolerance or thermal tolerance? And I want to be able to differentiate the two, right? Now, heat tolerance refers to the ability to sustain physical work, right? Preserve homeostasis. Now, the reason why you can sustain physical work is because you're able to preserve your, home, your state of homeostasis in temperature extremes. And this is not just referring to heat. This is referring to cold as well. The, cold, the, the same concept would apply to cold. The problem with these two is that we have been taught to understand that you know, a high level of heat stress equals to heat injury. 
in 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 our textbooks and you know it's written in many textbooks and even in med it's taught in medical school. And but I want to question whether are they truly connected? Do are these two things the same, or are they actually different conceptually? Okay, and does poor thermal regulation leads to poor thermal tolerance? It has been taught for more than a hundred years that poor thermal regulation leads to poor thermal tolerance. Uh, and I want to be able to share some data to, to help to understand uh, and query uh, this question uh, in the course of the next, this lecture and the next lecture. Um, I want to start by sharing with you some basic characteristics of human thermal regulation. Okay. And the first thing to understand, of course, we have a resting temperature. And this is 36.8 degrees plus minus 0 0.1 degrees. This is the temperature range that you know that 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 the brain regulates our temperature at rest. Uh, uh, this is the range you will measure when you sleep. Of course, in the daytime when we go about doing our work, you know, moving from places to places, uh, core temperature can range up to about 37.2, 37.5. That's the range you're talking about. But the reason why we are able to function and be comfortable where we are. We are able to function in the clothes that we wear and not feel very uncomfortable. Uh, it's because the brain regulates our temperature in that, at that level. Okay, And as I said, uh, uh, when, when we're in the state of this homeostasis, that's when fever takes place. That's when this regulatory system breaks down. And the reason why we're able to maintain our temperature so consistently is because of these characteristics called homeotherms, homeothermicity. Because humans are homeotherms. Our temperature regulation system is designed around a homeothermic uh, 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 operation. When we say homeothermic, it means that there's internal regulation. We're able to, in, to regulate our temperature internally. So when we're too cold, we will be, our body will be designed to lose heat. Uh, sorry, to, to retain heat and to produce heat. When we're too hot, the body will be designed to dissipate heat and to reduce heat production, right? So in doing so, the whole idea of thermal regulation you must think about is the concept of balance to achieve a thermal balance that's regulated around a set point. And this is important. When you think about temperature regulation, you got to think about a set point. The brain has a set temperature set point so that you know any departure from that that set point, it will try to correct it. Just like air condition, right? If you, if you program it to 22 degrees and the temperature goes up to 24 degrees, the thermostat will sense it's too hot and it will blow harder to bring temperature down again, isn't it? Same thing with a car. The reason why our car can operate without overheating is because it has a, a thermostat, a set point. It's the same thing. Our body, the brain has a temperature set point to regulate that, that, that temperature there. And, and, and is able to do that because of homeothermic function. And one key characteristics that allows us to be homeothermic is the idea of dual thermicity. There are two, there are two sets of temperature that operates in our body, okay? the shell and the core. And this is one of the important mechanisms that allow us to regulate temperature in that way. What, what is the shell? The shell is our skin temperature, all right? The shell is ectothermic. It's our skin temperature, really, the, the temperature we sense on our skin. And because it's ectothermic, it's, it's exposed to the environment, uh, the temperature that's, that's regulated on the skin uh, interacts with the environment. Right? We, we receive heat from the environment we, through the skin. We can also dissipate heat to the environment through the skin. Okay? And this is one important concept about heat, heat dissipation and heat absorption uh, between the skin and the environment. I'll be talking more about that in a while. The second temperature, which is more important, is core temperature. This is endothermic, meaning that it is internal to our body. And this is the temperature that is, uh, ex that, that is, a, this is the temperature that our cells, our organs are exposed to because it is, it is the temperature that's inside the body. Okay, and this is the temperature that's regulated internally by the brain. Whether you sweat or you shiver to produce heat when you're cold or you sweat when you're hot, right, is determined by your core temperature. So when your core temperature tells your brain I'm too hot, 
then the brain will trigger the sweating mechanism to lose heat. When your core temperature tells your brain, I'm too cold, then your brain will trigger the shivering mechanism to produce more heat and to, to lock down on heat dissipation. Right? So this is basically the function of, of, uh, of homeothermicity and duothermicity. And one of the interesting things that although we have two different uh, sets of temperature, there is a sequence to it in that the shell is slave to the core. In other words, the shell will adjust its function to dissipate heat, to absorb heat from the environment in order to maintain the core temperature. Okay, I hope everybody gets this now. All right, so the core temperature is our central temperature. And this is the, temp this is the data that goes to our brain to tell our brain what is the state of temperature now. And our brain has a, has a thermostat. And based on the thermostat, it will then make adjustments. And one of the ways you adjust is by losing heat to the environment or receiving heat from the environment. And this is a function of the shell. So the shell will function as a slave to the core. It will serve the purpose of the core. Now, this may look a bit complicated. Uh, I'll try to make it simple. So within the brain itself, there is a central command. Uh, and around the hypothalamic area, it's actually at the anterior optic area in the brain, where this that's where the thermostat sits in the brain, right? So that thermostat sits inside the brain and it receives information about the state of body temperature from a few sources. One is from uh, the blood that's coming back to the brain, all right? So when blood that comes back to the brain, because blood is flown through the, the, the entire body, uh, the temperature of the blood is equilibrated with core temperature. And the blood that flows to the brain will actually inform the brain what is the state of the core temperature over here. At the same time, you do get uh, temperature from the skin being fed back to the brain as well. So the brain also understands what is the state of the skin temperature. Based on what is being told, then the brain will decide, uh, is it too high or is it too low, right? Uh, and it will, it will then determine what is the error from the set point. Based on the error, whether is it too cold or too hot, it will then dissipate heat or absorb heat uh, through a few mechanisms. One of it is to our brain in the limbic system. What is the limbic system? Our limbic system is the one that drives comfort, right? We want to, we want to be in an environment where we are comfortable. So if you're too cold, uh, this temperature says that you're too cold, then the limbic system will make you go to a place that's warmer, will behave in a way that shelters you from losing heat from, from the cold. It will make you wear warm clothing, huddle, you know, stay closer to your friends, huddle together so your body remains warm. If that temperature tells you you're too hot, then this system will make you in a behave in a way that uh, minimizes heat, that, that promotes heat dissipation. Right, that, that uh, go into a place that's sheltered, go into an air-conditioned environment, stand in front of a fan, uh, go away from the crowd, go to a place where there's wind, uh, wear less clothing. Right, All those are regulated by the limbic system in the brain. So behavior is one way that we manage our temperature. The next, of course, is through sweating. Right, If you're too hot, then the brain will induce sweating through the sweat glands. In order for sweating to occur, there must be blood flow to the sweat gland, to the skin, right? And in order for blood flow to arrive at the skin, there must be vasodilation. The blood vessels at the skin must dilate to receive more blood so that, uh, so that you know, the, 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 the heat is transported to the skin surface and sweat will then help to bring the heat then to the surface. On the other hand, if the signal that is cold is that you're too cold, Right? And when you're too cold, what the brain does is that you shut down the sweating mechanism, you reduce blood flow to the skin so that there's less heat being transported to the surface and less heat being dissipated to the environment. And for that to happen, there must be vasoconstriction on the blood vessels at the skin, right? So that you reduce blood flow to the skin. Um, and that's the reason why, you know, there's this idea sometimes we think that when we drink alcohol, uh, we feel warm, we feel hot. And sometimes in the cold, we, we drink alcohol in order to, uh, to stay warm. Some people do that. And that's because when you drink alcohol, you see, you know, your, your skin becomes reddish. And because when you drink alcohol, 
you get more blood coming to the skin surface. And that's true. But what happens with that is that you actually lose more heat because more blood is transported to the skin surface. So when you're cold, you don't want more, you don't want blood to be coming to the skin surface. You want blood to be sheltered away from the skin surface. So drinking alcohol actually contradicts the idea of heat preservation in cold condition. Um, the last, of course, is heat production. The muscle is one of the main engines that, 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 has, that produces metabolic heat. And when you're too hot, the brain is activated to reduce uh, metabolism. When you're too cold, the brain is then activated to activate uh, uh, the muscle to, be, to, be, to, be, uh, to operate at a higher metabolic rate so that you produce more metabolic heat uh, every minute. So these are the basic concepts of how our brain regulates our temperature uh, in, in a very summarized version. The next thing I want to clarify is the idea of core temperature. So core temperature, as I said earlier, is the temperature that's in, internal to the body, is the temperature where our organs and our cells are exposed to, right? But for the brain to understand what is your core temperature, it has to be informed by a medium. Yes, the, that temperature has to be informed, that has to be transported to the brain. And the medium that transports the temperature to the brain is the blood, because blood flows through the, 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 the body before arriving at the brain, and as it flows through the body, it equilibrates itself with the, uh, the, the, the temperature of the internal part of the body. And so by, by sensing the temperature of the blood, the brain then understands what is the core temperature of the body. So there are different ways to measure core temperature, right? The most traditional way that has been used for many years uh, is rectal temperature, where they, they stick a rectal probe uh, into the anus about to 12 centimeters into the anus. Uh, when I first started doing heat research, uh, this was how, uh, this was how uh, I, I do my, my research. And that is why uh, uh, I, it's very difficult for me to get human subjects. Uh, this way of measuring temperature is used mainly in research, although, not, although much less now, and used in emergency uh, department to measure temperature of heat stroke victims. Uh, the second method of measuring core temperature is esophageal. Esophageal is the, the, the tract that's down your esophagus, uh, your digestive tract uh, below your throat. And the way to do this is to stick a, a, a soft, a, like a wire, the uh, temperature probe in a form like a wire, uh, either through the nose or through the throat and down to the chest level. This is another way to measure uh, core temperature. And this is done mainly in research, uh, also not very popular. Uh, the most popular method now for measuring core temperature is measuring gastrointestinal temperature. You look at the picture on the right over here, what you see is an uh, electronic temperature sensor. And the way we measure temperature with this is that we actually swallow the whole sensor. You're actually swallowing a thermometer with battery, with PCB board inside it. So this way of measuring uh, core temperature was actually designed originally for astronauts. Uh, when they go to space, uh, they measure temperature using an ingestible temperature sensor. Uh, but uh, since the 1990s, and for me, since the year 2000, uh, we have been using this for our research. And now most of the research that are published on temperature regulation uh, uses this form of temperature measurement. And, and what happens is that when you swallow it, uh, we usually swallow it the night before, the, the night before data collection. Uh, by the time they come to our lab the next morning, the sensor is actually in the intestine already. Yep. And therefore, we are measuring gastrointestinal temperature uh, as, as a form of core temperature. Um, the, the impractical side is, is that uh, it's very costly. Each one of these is about 150 US dollar. Uh, yeah, and, and these, are, these are FDA approved, so they are safe. And what happens after you swallow is you just, get, you just pass it up uh, uh, through the normal bowel movement. Yeah. So that's, that's gastrointestinal temperature. The next one is tympanic temperature. Now, tympanic temperature, strictly speaking, measures temperature inside the ear at the tympanic membrane. And the reason why that is a site for temperature measurement is because uh, the tympanic membrane is very close to the, to the brain. And therefore, the temperature of blood going to the brain uh, would also pass by the tympanic membrane. The difficulty is that it is very difficult to reach the tympanic membrane. 
even with a even with a, a, a electronic thermometer that you know you use in the clinic. Yep, uh, and therefore uh, uh, the infrared thermometer, um, you know, is because of the shape of the ear canal. Uh, you almost never measure real tympanic temperature. It's very difficult to measure. The last one is ear canal temperature, and this is the one that the doctor would use when you go to the clinic to measure if you have a fever. Uh, and the reason why this is uh, uh, usable in fever and not so much in, in research is because when you have a fever, there's a clear departure of temperature and, you know, from, from resting. And therefore, the sensitivity, you need not need very high sensitivity in order to pick up the change in temperature. And that's why it's seldom used in research. If you're interested to know more about temperature measurement, you can read my publication that I published in 2008. Uh, it's all inside there. Okay, a um, few more things to define before we talk about the, uh, the thermal regulation concepts and physiology. Um, now, temperature itself has got different, there are different ways to express heat stress. There are different ways to express uh, a core temperature. And just, I just want to share with you, uh, and some people use them interchangeably, which is wrong. So I just want to share with you what do they mean, right? So there are terms like heat stress, heat strain, are they the same? Uh, if they are not the same, then what is heat strain? What is heat stress? And, and, and do they represent temperature regulation? Okay. So um, this is just a, a, a fictitious graph to show you the change in temperature when you exercise, you know, uh, your temperature goes up from about 37 degrees to maybe 39, 40 degrees or so, right? The usual rise in temperature. Um, the first thing I want to define is heat strain. Now, physiologically, when we talk about strain, strain refers to departure from resting, right? You, you think of a spring when you talk about strain. So when the spring is not stretched, it is at its, it is at its normal length, now, strain happens when you stretch the spring. So there's a change from resting level. So same thing, when we talk about heat strain, we are referring to the change in temperature, okay? So here it is, the change in core temperature. So if you want to measure heat strain, you take the peak temperature, which is the highest temperature, you minus the resting temperature. That change in temperature is your heat strain. All right, physiologically strain refers to a departure from resting condition. So if my resting temperature is 37, after playing soccer for one hour, my, my temperature is now 39 degrees. My heat strain is 39 minus 37, two degrees Celsius. That's the level of strain my body is exposed to, okay? The next term I want to define is heat stress. What is heat stress? Physiologically, the definition of stress is the total demand for physiological adaptation. How much of, the, how much of physiological adaptation does your body need to activate in order to maintain homeostasis? That's the, that's the basic definition of stress, regardless of any type of stress. So when we talk about heat stress, we are, we are answering the question, how much of heat load does the body have to manage in order to, ma to maintain homeostasis, right? And therefore, if you want to know your total heat load, you got to look at your peak temperature because that is the total amount of heat, highest amount of heat that your body need to be able to regulate, need to be able to function at, and to protect your, your cells and to protect the organs, prevent it from damaging under the level of heat stress. So you have heat strain, which is a change in temperature. You have heat, heat stress, which is the total heat load, right? And that's your peak core temperature. So using the same an analogy, right? Uh, my, my body temperature starts at 37. After one hour of soccer, my peak temperature, my highest temperature is 39 degrees. My level of heat stress is 39 degrees Celsius, okay? But just looking at this alone doesn't tell me how well my body is regulating my temperature. The measure of temperature regulation is the measure of the angle of this line. How acute, how sharp or how flat is this, is, is this slope? 
the angle of it. All right, and that is called the rate of change in temperature. Right? How quick does your temperature rise or rate of rise in temperature or rate of change in temperature? And when we talk about rate in anything, when you're going to measure rate, you divide by time. You divide your, 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 numer your denominator is time. Your numerator is what you want to measure, whether is it heart rate, breathing rate, uh, any kind of rate. Okay? Uh, in this case, when we talk about heat stress or, or temperature regulation, we're talking about body temperature. So if my if my my starting temperature is 37, after one hour, I my my temperature is 39 degrees, right? To know how well my body is regulating my temperature, I look at the rate of change. And I do that by dividing the two degrees, heat strain, divide by 60 minutes. That's the time that I, I spend to for temperature to increase two, two, uh, uh, two degrees Celsius, okay? So if I want to compare temperature regulation of two person, person A, person B, I don't look at their, their heat strain, I don't look at their heat stress because they may start at different temperature. I look at their, their, their rate of change in core temperature and I compare that by measuring the heat strain divided by time or between two person. Okay, so here I want to answer the question of whether is temperature regulation same as heat tolerance or, or, or thermal tolerance. So over here, what you see is two, two slope, right? right? This is time on this axis. This is core temperature. And on the top line is, is the, the rate of rise, okay? The, temp, the rate that the temperature rises over time and at the bottom line is show a slow is another line which is a slower rate of rise. So assuming the top is when when your is your first line, and after a period of training, heat acclimatization, your body improved in the way it regulates temperature. And so when you do the same amount of work, the temperature rises at a slower rate. You get a reduction in the rate of change in temperature. You get an improvement in thermal regulation. Right. The question is when there's an improvement in thermal regulation, does it mean your heat tolerance also improve? And I'll help you to understand that using this diagram. So assuming that the red line you see at the top is the threshold for heat tolerance, meaning that above this temperature over here, uh, your body cannot tolerate the heat anymore. You collapse, you cannot continue working the heat, right? And if this, is, if this line doesn't change and there's a drop in your rate of rise in temperature, what happens is this, right? That's your threshold for failure or heat injury. When you have an improvement in temperature regulation, all it means is that you take a longer time to arrive at your temperature threshold. So before you acclimatize, before your body has an improvement in temperature regulation, you will reach your uh, uh, threshold at this point. But when you have an improvement in temperature regulation, say you undergo training, you undergo heat acclimatization, your, your, your rate of change uh, occurs at a slower rate. What it means is that you take a longer time, you take a longer time to reach this threshold. There's no implication on your heat tolerance because your threshold remains the same. Right? So an improvement in temperature regulation alone does not automatically imply that your heat tolerance also improve. Your heat tolerance improve only when there's an increase in this threshold of tolerance, meaning that it, you, can, you can tolerate a higher level of heat load. You can tolerate a higher core temperature before you collapse, before you uh, and unable to perform physical work in the heat. All right, so for the same line, say we take this line, right? Previously, your threshold is here. Now, your threshold is here, right? That means, if that happens, it means that you have an improvement in heat tolerance, okay? But if, the, if, if there's no change in your threshold and there's improvement in, 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 your, in your rate of rise in temperature, all it means is, 
you are able to perform the the work and 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 arrive at the temperature threshold. Uh, you you take a longer time to arrive at the temperature threshold without affecting this change itself. Okay, so for there to be a change in thermal tolerance, there has to be a change in the threshold of thermal tolerance, meaning the point where you collapse or heat injury, the point where you 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 your body experience fatigue, you cannot sustain the work, right? But and and and. and Improving in temperature regulation alone does not automatically imply that. So from here, I hope you, 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 you see that, that, that temperature regulation is a very different concept from, temp, from heat tolerance. And this is where people always get mixed up. And this is even taught wrongly in some medical schools as well. right? So, so I hope that after this lecture, you're able to appreciate the difference between thermal regulation and thermal tolerance. Okay, now how does the body balances the heat? Um, let me see, what's the time? Maybe, can I suggest that I, I take five minutes to take questions before we... Are there any questions at this point? Because I know I've covered quite a lot. Please, if any question, you can yeah. ask directly or you can write in the chat box. Uh. Yeah, uh, Dr. Titin, thank you very okay. much. May I have questions? Yeah. Yes, please, uh, Dr. Hardian. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, that's good. Okay, yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Fabian. Uh, very uh, interesting and very nice uh, lecture. So my question is, uh, like, um, as we know that before prior to exercise, uh, there is uh, anticipatory response on cardiovascular system and respiratory system. Is there any anticipatory response in uh, thermodynamic of body heat? Thank you, Professor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not before exercise, but during exercise. Oh. Okay, I will show you some uh, evidence in the next lecture. There's this theory called the central governor theory, where in the course of the exercise, the brain anticipate mm. the potential occurrence of a catastrophe. Yes. Okay. And by that anticipation, it actually back regulate your heat production. Mm. Yeah. So sometimes, so, yeah. Yes, so it's yeah, during just, the exercise. Yeah. yeah. So not uh, before exercise, like uh, cardiovascular system and re respiratory system. Yeah, not, not before. In the case okay. of temperature regulation, during the exercise. Okay, Professor. Yeah. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Titin. Thank you. Yeah. Thank Maybe you, Dr. Take... Hardia yeah. from Universitas take... Diponegoro. Mm -hmm. Any else question? Okay. No? One? Dr. Yeah. Agus? Uh, Dr. Yeah. Agus? Oh, uh, yeah. Please, okay. Dr. Agus. Uh, Professor Fabian, yes, my name is Agus. Uh, do you think that when we exercise in a hot uh, room or climate, uh, it will limit also our cardiorespiratory uh, capacity? Because I uh, experienced by myself that when uh, I am exercising in on a treadmill my heart frequency is higher when i am not doing it in air conditioned room yes it is correct so it definitely it correct. is lowering our uh, work capacity well there is a diversion of blood flow to the skin yes because for sweating and because of the diversion there's a reduction in venous return mm. there's less blood going back to the heart so because there's less blood going back to the heart you get a lower stroke volume yeah but the muscle is demanding a high demanding a high uh, blood supply high blood flow yeah yeah where when the the stroke volume is reduced mm. so in order to maintain the cardiac output heart rate has to compensate for stroke volume, yes. right? Mm -hmm. That's why you get a higher heart rate because of the sweating mechanism. 
Actually, yes. I have a slide, maybe three or four slides away, uh, that shares exactly the data that you just mentioned. Yeah. Yeah, I, in a few slides down, I have a data to show you uh, that, that effect, what you just mentioned. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Dr. Agus. Yeah, uh, thank thank you. you for joining with us. Yes. Yeah, thank uh, you. So, You're welcome. Uh, Pleasure. Professor Fabian, in here yeah. also have so many society from uh, physiology Indonesia. Very good, fantastic. Yeah. I'm very happy to meet everyone. Thank you for the opportunity. So, and here also not only from UNES, also have University Education, Indonesia Education, UPI. UP, oh. UP, also UNP in Padang University. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. And UNIMED also have in here. Okay. okay. I'm very Thank glad you. to meet everyone. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so happy to meet everyone. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Yep. Any more questions before we move on to the next part? Yeah, please. Okay. If, yep. Who have any question again? Okay, maybe you can continue to okay, can. the second part. So I'll go on to the second part. Now that I've uh, I've defined uh, I've, I've defined the terminologies and I've kind of explained the basic concepts. Now there are two mechanisms that, that manages the balance of heat in our body. How much heat is retained, how much heat is produced, how much heat is dissipated from our body. One set of mechanism is our physical. It uses the, uh, uh, the laws of physics to transfer heat between compartments, okay? Another set of mechanism is physiological, right? It uses physiological mechanisms to remove heat from the body. And these two has to work together. So I'm going to explain the physical uh, uh, perspective or the physical laws that, that, that helps us to maintain thermal balance in the body, okay? And this is the, uh, the, the equation for, for heat storage or thermal balance from a physical perspective. Yeah. Uh, are we able to... Are we able to silence to, to mute? Huh? Hello, Professor Fab Lim. Yes, you can hear me. Yes, you can hear me. Yes, you can to Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor. Okay. Yeah, so this is the, the heat storage or heat balance equation. And it says that the amount of heat that we store in our body is determined by these few uh, physical avenues of heat exchange. The first is positive. Positive meaning that it only adds heat to the body and that's our metabolic heat production, all right? The second is by the avenue of convection. The third is the, and this is either positive or negative. Positive negative means that you can remove heat from the body or you can add heat back to the body, okay? Uh, there's conduction and there's radiation. So convection, conduction, and radiation are bi-directional in that it can remove heat from the body or add heat from the environment, absorb heat into the body. That's why it's bi-directional. Evaporative heat loss is negative, meaning that it can only lose heat through evaporation and not add heat to the body. Okay, so there's, if you look at this equation, there are five factors, there are five physical properties of heat exchange. Uh, metabolic heat production, uh, uh, two of them are unidirectional. Metabolism is positive. Evaporation is negative. And the other three, conduction, convection, and radiation, they are bidirectional, meaning you can gain or lose heat through these avenues. I'll talk about metabolism first, okay? And, and the basic principle to think about heat flow in a physical, in a physical concept uh, is that heat will always go from high to lower a uh, uh, higher level of heat of temperature to low level of temperature. That's, that's the basic uh, physical property of heat, okay? So the first is metabolic heat. As you know, our body uh, produces, you know, through metabolism produces heat 24 hours a day. That's how we, we, we function. That's how our cells are maintained. And, you know, through, and a byproduct of heat, of, of metabolism uh, is, is heat, okay? Because what had the... the the currency or the storage of energy in the body is in 
ATP, all right? And when ATP, and when ATP uh, one of the phosphate is split from ATP uh, to ADP, you get a release of heat energy of 7.3 kilocalories. And it is this heat energy that is harnessed to, for mechanical work, to move the muscles, to, 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 for muscles to contract, okay? The problem is that our, our, the efficiency of our energy system is only about 25%, 25 to 30%, quite similar to a car. So when you burn a liter of petrol, only, only, only 25 to 30% of that liter goes to move the car. The other 70% are actually heat that has to come up from the exhaust pipe. Our body is almost similar. From the heat that is produced through the splitting of ATP, only 20 to 30% goes to, uh, to, to, to energizing the muscle for contraction. The other 70% is useless heat. Heat that has got no physiological function, but causes the heat in the body to increase. That's why when we exercise, our body heats up. Okay, and that that amount of heat needs to be removed from the body. Otherwise, the muscles firstly need to be removed from the muscle. Otherwise, the muscle will heat up, the proteins will degenerate, and, and your muscles will you know get injured. And and after that, it has to be removed from the body. Otherwise, your body will heat up. All right. Um, RMR is resting metabolic rate. So at rest, we expend about one met of energy. In terms of, of, of oxygen consumption, it's about 3.5 milliliters of oxygen for every kilogram of body weight per minute. That's our resting metabolic rate. Okay. And if you want to calculate how much of kilocalories you're burning every day, you measure VO2, absolute VO2. For every liter of VO2, we expend about 4.8 kilocalories. Right, so for you, you convert your RMR into your body weight, you multiply by a thousand, you get liters of VO2 per minute. You multiply by 60, you get 60 uh, liters of VO2 for every 60 minutes. You multiply by 24, you get liters of VO2 for every 24 hours. So you know how many liters of oxygen you, you, you use up every, every day. You multiply by 4.8, that is the amount of calories we use up every day. Um, during exercise, our metabolic rate can increase by 10 to 24. And that is why the amount of heat that is produced also increased by 10 to 24. Uh, and as I said, with that increase, we need to remove about 70-75% of redundant heat. So this is heat that's added to the body that needs to be removed. So one of the way of removing heat is by contact, okay, a conduction. By contact. So if your skin touches another, another surface, uh, with a difference in temperature, heat will flow from hot, hotter to cooler temperature. So when you hold a cup of ice water, because your skin is warmer than ice from the, and the, uh, than the cup, the temperature will flow from the skin down to the cup. Okay, that is why when you're hot, right, you put a cold towel around your skin, you feel good. And this is the reason why when someone has got fever, or when in the in, in, in a hot environment you don't have air condition, one of the recommendations is wipe yourself with cool towel, with, with ice water towel, because of conduction. Heat is transferred from your skin to the cold surface, the towel, by conduction. Okay. On the other hand, if you carry something that is that has got higher temperature than your skin, so if you're a soldier, you carry electronic equipment, and that temperature is higher than your skin the heat from the equipment will flow from the equipment to the skin. All right, so, so you need to think about that in terms of conduction. The next one is uh, by way of convection. Convection is heat exchange. So adding heat to the body or removing heat from the body by a medium that is flowing through the body. Okay, so when, you, when wind blows across our body, that's, and, and if the wind is colder than our skin, then it will, it will remove heat from our body as well by convection, all right? On, on the other hand, if the, in a period of heat wave, if the air temperature is higher than your skin temperature, when your wind blows across the skin, it actually adds heat to the skin. That is why during heat wave, the fan does, it does not serve any function, okay? Because the, the, the temperature of the air is warmer than the skin. So when you blow hot air to the skin, uh, you're actually adding heat to the skin. 
Okay, so in order for air to be effective in, in cooling you down, the temperature of the air needs to be cooler than the temperature of the skin because heat flows from warmer to cooler surfaces. All right, the other medium that, that cools us down through water is by, is, is oh, sorry, cools, cools us down by, by, by convection is water, right? So when you shower, when you feel very cold, you take a warm shower, right? Why do you feel warm, nice and warm when you take a warm shower? It's because the temperature of the water is warmer than the skin. As the temperature flows through the body, uh, heat is transferred from the, from the hot water to the skin. Similarly, when you're, when you're very hot or when you're treating a heat stroke patient, what do you do? You put them in ice water or you, or you, you put them in running water. Why? Because it, the temperature of the water is cooler than the skin. So, the, the, so heat will be removed from the skin to the water, okay? The next one is exchange by radiation. And this is uh, where, because heat is a physical entity, uh, it, can, it, it can flow in the environment. Like I says, as I said, from hot to cool environment. And this is heat transferred from a source that is a distant away, all right? So one of the main source of heat absorption through radiation is the sun, right? You stand under the sun, you get you don't you don't touch the sun, but quite far away from the sun, but you get heat radiated from the sun to our skin. Okay, so this is heat exchange by by a heat source. So the human itself, we can be a heat source as well. When we are in the cold environment, when our skin is warmer than the environment, we radiate heat to the environment. That's why when you're when we're in air conditioned and environment, our our, we, we feel cool, we lose heat because our skin is warmer than the environment. We dissipate heat to the environment through radiation. When you're running, like you see the picture like this, so close together, these are, these are Singapore recruits, uh, you radiate heat to one another. If you are too close to one another, okay? So this is, these are the basic concept of heat exchange by, by physical properties. The last means of heat dissipation is the most important because 80% of our heat, especially during exercise, is removed by evaporation. Evaporation is a physical, uh, is a physical, how should I, physical state where liquid changes to gaseous state, okay? So when you sweat, right, your sweat is liquid. Now, listen to this carefully, yeah? Sweating alone does not remove heat. Just by sweating alone, you don't remove heat. You only lose water. Sweat needs to evaporate for heat to be dissipated. So this is where people always get the wrong idea. They look at their, 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 their shirt, you know, the sweat is all over. You know, their, their, their t-shirt is soaked with sweat. The towel is soaked with sweat. The sweat is dripping around them. They think that they're dissipating heat. But when the sweat does not change to gaseous state by evaporation, there's no, there's very little heat that's being removed. You, what you're losing is heat. Uh, what you're losing is fluid, is water from the body. Okay? So remember this. And, and what determines whether your sweat can, dis can evaporate or don't evaporate? It is the moisture in the environment. How dry is the air? The humidity is in the environment. And that's the reason why when you exercise in an environment with low humidity, Right? Your sweat dissipates faster. You see your skin is drier. When you exercise in a state of high humidity, you see that your sweat is trapped in a shirt, in a t-shirt and drips in onto the floor and so on. Okay, so understand this. This is important because, because the lack of evaporation itself, in the absence of environmental heat, you don't have sufficient evaporation. That itself can cause your temperature to increase to a point of causing heat injury. This is something that a lot of people don't realize. Okay, other than environmental heat, high humidity is a cause of heat stress when you exercise, right? Um, and this is important because, as I said, 80% of heat dissipation occurs through evaporation during exercise. Okay, so this is the physical uh, avenues of heat exchange, right? Now I want to show you some, uh, illustrate to you what this means. 
So, for example, in Singapore, we're in trouble because we have we have, we, have, we have both heat and humidity. I think in some parts of Indonesia, it's the same as well. So, when you're out in the open, you get environmental heat, you get heat radiated uh, to the body. At the same time, the body produces metabolic heat, isn't it? And because your body gets hot, you start to sweat and you, you try to evaporate the sweat. You, and hopefully, you get 80% of heat loss through evaporation. And then you get heat dissipation. There are two scenarios over here. One is you are in an environment of low humidity where the air is dry. The other one is you're in an environment of high humidity where the air is very moist. Okay? So when you're in an environment of low humidity, your sweat evaporates quite quickly and heat is removed from the body quite readily. All right? Effective heat dissipation. But in high humidity, your sweat drips off and minimum heat is being removed from the body. You see... It's a double whammy when you're in high humidity environment because not only you, you don't dissipate heat, you lose fluid from the body. And where does that fluid come from? It comes from the plasma in your blood. So when you sweat a lot, eventually your blood volume, your plasma volume shrinks, your blood volume also shrinks. All right? And that's why it's difficult to sustain exercise uh, without rehydration. I'll talk about this in a while. So in Singapore, our relative humidity is about 60 to 75% in the noon time. Okay, so in the noon time when you're, and our temperature is about 32 to 35 degrees. Either way, we lose. <laughs> you know, when you exercise in the daytime, you've got high humidity, high temperature. When you exercise in the night, every night at about 1 a.m., 2 a.m. in the morning, humidity goes up to about 90, 95%. This is how high the humidity is in Singapore. And that is why at one time there was this marathon called um, Sundown Marathon, where they will run a, a double marathon overnight. They will start running at night and they will, they will run two marathons overnight. And the idea was that, well, I run in the night because it's cool. But nobody realized that when you run in the night, there's the evil of high humidity. Your body cannot remove the heat and you're producing heat continuously because you're running in a marathon, okay? So the main message I want to give to you is that don't just look at environmental heat. You need to pay attention to the humidity as well because both are equally harmful. Now, this is the distribution of heat injury cases in the Singapore Armed Forces from 93 to 2001. Excuse me. About 718 cases. And that's the time of occurrence. And this is the... WBGT is the level of heat stress. Now, if you look at this case, right, the level at between noon to about three o'clock, uh, yeah, four o'clock, you have the lowest when the heat, the heat stress level is high, is the highest. Now, this is in a way artificial because of the high temperature in the in the noon time, the strenuous training is reduced in the military during this period. And that's why you have lower, you have lower cases of heat injury. But what is more real is this. You look at the heat cases from 6 o'clock in the morning to, uh, to before 12 o'clock in the afternoon and from uh, 4 o'clock in the afternoon to 12 midnight. Even though the environment is cool, you can still get quite a significant number of heat cases when you train in these conditions. Why? Because our humidity is very high in the night. Okay? So that's, the, that's, that's the something I need you to be aware of. So that's the physical, uh, how should I say, aspects of temperature regulation. I want to now move to talk about the physiological aspects of temperature regulation. Okay. Now, so when you exercise in the heat, as far as uh, temperature regulation is concerned, physiologically, there are three things that happen in the body. One is that you get an increase in metabolic rate, right? Everybody knows because when you exercise, you, you expend more energy, more ATP is used, more heat is produced. So you get an increase in metabolic rate. I explained that earlier. Second thing is that when you produce more heat that you can dissipate, uh, your the level of heat storage in the body increases, okay? So, and, and this is why most of the time, especially in our part of the world, when you exercise, the body temperature gets higher. That's because the amount of heat that's produced uh, is more than what you can dissipate. 
And the third thing that happens is that because of the increase in, 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 in body temperature, you get an increase in sweat as well. Sweat. And, and we can sweat between about one liter to about four liters every hour. Everybody sweats differently. Okay, can you imagine four liters of sweat <laughs> every hour? That's the volume of water we are losing from the body. Okay, I, I have a separate lecture on, on fluid intake during exercise. I'm not sure I'll, I'll have the time to talk about it in the next lecture. If not, we can talk about it other time. But very briefly, this is what happens when you exercise in the heat. So when we exercise in the heat, as I said, uh, metabolic heat production occurs inside the muscle. And that heat has to be removed because if it's not removed, very quickly the muscles get overheated, the, pro the, the, the proteins itself, the cells of the muscles will start to denature and you start to lose muscle cells almost acutely. Okay, You can't sustain that kind of physical work. And the way the body removes heat from the muscles is by convection. Now, when you exercise, what goes to the muscle? Blood flow, right? So when your blood flows to the muscle, the blood is cooler than the muscle. And heat is transferred from the muscles to the blood that's flowing through it. Okay, so the blood that is coming out from the muscles are actually hotter than the blood that, is, that went into the muscle. So this is the first thing you need to understand. Huh? Uh, 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 metabolic heat in the muscle is removed by blood flow, by, 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 by convection, you know, as the blood flows through the uh, uh, muscles and heat is transferred from the muscle to the blood. But that heat that is in the blood needs to be removed because otherwise the blood also gets overheated. And the way that it is removed is that you get blood going to the skin. All right, the blood is channeled to the skin. And, and because there's more blood going to the skin, Remember, we talked about vasodilation just now. The, the, the skin blood vessels will increase. Therefore, more blood goes there. And that heat is then dissipated. Uh, you, know, you induce a sweating function. And that heat is then dissipated to the environment through evaporation, through radiation, and through, most of the time, convection. Uh, not so much a conduction unless you're touching a cold surface. Okay? Now, the, the problem with this is this. Because in cool condition, your blood flow will go back directly to the heart. But now, because you need to, you, the, you need to dissipate heat, the blood flow gets channeled to the skin before it, you know, it goes back to the heart. So you get a detour of blood flow. As a result of, of that, as I said earlier, I was explaining to Dr. Agus, you get a reduction in venous return to the heart. You get less blood going to the heart. You get less blood feeling the left, chamber of the heart, the left ventricle of the heart, right? When you get less blood in the left ventricle, you got less blood to pump out, isn't it? The outcome is that you get a reduction in stroke volume. And in order to maintain your cardiac output, your heart rate has to increase. So Dr. Agus, this is the mechanisms we're talking about, right? I just want to, so if I can summarize this part now, the basic concept in thermal regulation is that when you exercise, the muscles and the skin competes for blood flow. The blood needs to go to the skin to dissipate heat. At the same time, the muscles demand is demanding a high amount of blood. Okay, Because of this competition, there's an increase in cardiovascular stress. The heart has to beat a lot harder in order to maintain cardiac output. Okay, I hope everybody understands that. Now, when you sustain this and you come to a point where it cannot be sustained, then what happens is you go into a state of fatigue. Your performance has to drop. And that's the reason why when you perform in the heat, your performance is usually when you perform in cool, cooler environment, your performance is better than the, when you perform in the heat because of this effect on the cardiovascular system, because of blood supply problem. In the worst case scenario, when you, you, know, you consciously overcome the discomfort and you push yourself, then basically you, you, you collapse of dehydration, right? Because there's not enough blood going back to the heart. And this is one thing I want to clarify here because uh, I may not speak about hydration to you in, this, in these two lectures. The worst case scenario for dehydration is that you collapse because it is a self-limiting mechanism. 
there's always this idea that when you don't drink enough water, you get heat stroke, you, you, you die of dehydration. There's no evidence of that in the literature. Okay, I've looked at the literature the last 20 years. There's nothing to suggest that when you don't drink enough water in sports, you get heat stroke. There's no evidence of that. There's nothing to show that when you don't drink enough water during sports, you die of dehydration because it's a self-limiting mechanism. So this is one of the things I hope everybody will learn. The danger of dehydration is not as much as the danger of overhydration. Okay, when you drink too much, you get what is known as uh, uh, hyponatremia. You dilute the blood of sodium and that can cause death. And that, it, that has caused death before. Okay, so drinking too much water is, is easier to die from drinking too much water. It's very hard to die from not drinking enough water because there's a self-limiting mechanism. When you're dehydrated, basically, you don't have enough blood going back to the brain, you lose consciousness, you collapse, and you stop exercising, right? Hopefully, you find water source and you can rehydrate in that sense, all right? So I'll come to that part about fluid here. So this is one primary mechanism. The second mechanism is this. Now you're losing about one to four liters of water. On top of this effect, you have a second effect. You're losing one to four liters of water at the same time, concurrently. And that itself, as I said, that sweat, the fluid from the sweat comes from your plasma. All right, if you don't replace enough fluid, what happens is not only you got less venous return to the heart, you got less blood flowing around the body. The second effect. Okay, because you've got a shrinking of blood volume. So when you get, get that, you get a double whammy. Okay. Um, normally, when, you, when we exercise, when we lose sweat, because we store a lot of our body in different compartments. Okay, 60% of our body weight is due to water. So if you have 60 kilogram, we have 42 liters of water in our body. Of that 42 liters, 5 liters are in the blood in the blood circulation. The other 37 liters are in your intracellular fluid and your extracellular fluid. When you start to sweat and your plasma volume start to shrink, the fluid from your extracellular compartments and intracellular compartments will move, will try to move into the blood vessels, the intravascular space, in order to protect your blood volume. But it can only protect that up to a deficit 2% of body weight, okay? That means if you exercise, you find that you lose, you're losing weight. We, we measure fluid balance in, during exercise by measuring body weight, okay? One kilogram of body weight is one liter of water, all right? And typically the fluid from the intercellular fluid and intracellular fluid, they're able to defend your plasma volume for up to a deficit 2% of body weight loss. Okay, so if you're 70 kilogram, 1.4 liters of body weight of, of, of body weight loss. If you don't have, you don't drink enough fluid, you, you deplete the blood volume and it will increase the stress, uh, you will it will perpetuate and, and increase the stress on this part of the mechanism. It will stress your, 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 your cardiovascular system and therefore it collapse. On the other hand, if you're to replace fluid, right? It helps to preserve your blood volume and it helps to preserve uh, the, the, the venous return going back to the heart. It doesn't, it doesn't prevent the, 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 the blood flow from going to the skin, but at least it protects the blood volume and that minimizes the effects of this, of this uh, pathway. And it, in a way, it helps to sustain your physical work longer. What this means is it actually... Uh, this is the reason why we need to replace fluid during exercise. You know, and, and the replacement of fluid during exercise is not for temperature regulation purpose. It's not for heat injury prevention. It is to sustain blood flow. Okay, so this is one point I think everybody needs to understand. It's to sustain blood flow, is to sustain your performance level. Because if your blood don't flow, your muscles cannot contract, you cannot perform. Okay, I will show you other data later that it has got very minimum impact on temperature regulation and even heat injury. But as I said earlier, there's a danger 
of over drinking because there's again this whole idea of drinking during exercise has been taught wrongly for many years drinking during sports should not be driven by volume because every one of us sweat differently okay so one person may need half a liter one another person may need two liters an hour so you cannot have a volume to say everybody must drink one liter every hour that's a wrong way to manage fluid intake during sports you drink during sports by your thirst mechanism. All right? So you drink when you're thirsty. When you're not thirsty, it's fine. You can continue playing and you're thirsty again, just drink again. That's sufficient to sustain, uh, to protect your, 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 to preserve your blood volume, even in these kind of conditions. Um, and, that, and when you exercise, we are expected to be mildly dehydrated. Mildly dehydrated. All right? The body performs well when we're, when we're in this condition. And, and when we say mildly dehydrated, we're, again, we're looking at not more than 2 to 3% of body weight loss. Okay, so I would encourage you in your physical education classes to, to, to do this as a lab. Measure your body weight before and after exercise and calculate how many percent of body weight have you lost. Okay, and you convert back to your body weight, that's how many liters? And, and therefore, you know what your fluid deficit level. At the end of the exercise, you will be in deficit, fluid deficit. Okay? And this is when you replace, the fluid replacement takes place after the exercise, not during the exercise. All right? So this is the graph I promised Dr. Agus just now uh, to show him in an experimental uh, setting about the effects of heat stress uh, on the heart, on, on heartbeat. Uh, this is data produced by my, my honor student. We published this in EJAP in 2013. It was meant to study something else, but it turned out such beautifully to explain uh, temperature regulation. So the subject came to us twice. Once they ran in hot condition, and other times they ran in cool condition. So hot is about 35 degrees. Cool condition was about 25 degrees. And this is all in an environmental chamber where we control the conditions in the room. The graph you see on top is the core temperature and the, the, the solid line is when they ran in hot condition, the temperature and the dotted lines when they ran in cool condition on two different occasions, one week apart. They ran at 70% VO2 max for one hour, right? The bottom graph is the same it's the same experiment, but this is the heart rate instead, all right? So what you see here, let's look at the top first. Uh, they rested for, for about 15 minutes, and then when they start running, very soon, they start running about here. When they start running, you can see in both the cool and the warm condition, uh, you go into a state of positive heat storage. Why? Because temperature starts to rise. That's when your body starts to store heat. That's why temperature starts to rise, okay? And the departure in temperature comes at about 15 minutes after the run, where the, the core temperature for the, the hot environment rose at a faster rate of change. Remember, we talked about rate of change in temperature compared to the same person running in cooler temperature. And that, that difference in temperature was maintained even after uh, 15 minutes of rest after the run. Okay, they finished running here. They rested for 15 minutes here. So this is interesting because I want you to look at the heart rate response. All right, so, so they rested 15 minutes and immediately when they started running, uh, the, 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 there's cardiovascular compensation, right? Your heart got to work harder to supply, to, to supply the, uh, the cardiac output to the muscles. And look at this. The temperature difference in temp only occurred at about 20 minutes into the run, 15 or 20 minutes into the run. But the increase in heart rate in the hot environment occurred five minutes into the run. Okay, that means from five minutes to 20 minutes, the heart rate actually compensates for the higher level of heat stress when you're running in hot condition. Okay. From here to here, you see, temperature was able, you're able to maintain temperature for the first 20 minutes of the run, but heart rate was higher in the hot environment from the five minutes of run onwards. So from five minutes to 20 minutes, the heart was working extra hard compared to cool condition in order to 
keep temperature at the same level as the cool condition. All right, but beyond that, it's unable to control, and therefore the heartbeat continues to rise and temperature continues to rise. So this again shows you the physiological, uh, you know, the physiology of what I was just talking about. And you know, if you look at the rise of temperature here and the departure only at 20 minutes throughout, that's what the brain is doing to try to keep temperature as low as possible. Okay. Uh, this is an interesting experiment that's done in, uh, in South Africa. Um, what they did was they compared African runners with Caucasian runners uh, in hot and cool environment. All right. So um, they ran at 70% of their peak treadmill velocity for 30 minutes. After that, they ran at their self and they did an uh, eight kilometers uh, time trial. Basically, they, they run the eight kilometers as fast as possible. So they ran on the treadmill at 70% of peak treadmill velocity for half an hour. And immediately they went into an eight kilometer time trial. Everybody tried to run that eight kilometer as fast, fast as possible. They did this twice on different days. Once in cool and humid condition, 15 degrees, 60% humidity. Another time in warm and humid condition, 35 degrees, 60% relative humidity. So in the cool condition, the African and the Caucasian runners, the timing was about the same. 27.4 minutes, 27, oh yeah, about 27.4 20, minutes average. Not much difference. Now, when they ran in the warm condition, look at what happens here. The African runners took, firstly, it took longer in warm condition, 29.7 minutes. But look at the Caucasian runners. It took them 33 minutes to complete. So there was no difference in performance in cool condition. But when it came to warm condition, the, the Caucasian runners, uh, uh, took three minutes longer to run the eight kilometers time trial. And this was the explanation given by uh, uh, Tim Noakes and Carl Marino, uh, who did this experiment. Uh, so the, the African runner, runners ran faster at similar or slower rate of heat storage. Because the body was lighter, they needed less energy to complete the same distance. And therefore, the body produced a lower amount of heat. Whereas the Caucasian runners, because they were heavier, the body has to produce more heat to transport a higher load over the same distance. And therefore, there was more heat storage in the Caucasian runners compared to the African runners. Okay, Suggesting that the Caucasian runners reduce their speed to maintain an optimal rate of heat storage. And this is what we meant by the brain regulating your performance in order to protect your heat thermal regulation. It is a classic experiment to show how the brain regulate performance based on body temperature. Uh, this is a uh, data from my own laboratory that we published in 2006. We measured core temperature continuously in 18 runners who were participating in a half marathon. Uh, this is the first set of continuous core temperature measurement to be published in the world uh, using the temperatures ingestible temperature sensor I, I showed you earlier. So we divided the, the 18 runners into three groups, right? Those who finished the fastest, uh, the half marathon in 100 to about 111 minutes, the average runners who finished half marathon in 111 to 117 minutes, and the slow runners who finished the half marathon in 120 to 146 minutes. There are, two, there are, there are many uh, messages from this, but I just want to focus on two messages. The first, if you look at the red line, is 40 degrees. For more than 100 years, we are taught that above 40 degrees, you get heat injury, you get heat stroke. We have 18 runners here. Eight of them had body temperatures that went above 40 degrees for a good half an hour or more, right? None of them have heat injury. None of them have heat stroke. And this was one of the very first set of data to prove in a, by using continuous temperature measurement that humans can tolerate more than 40 degrees Celsius in, in, in good health, right? The highest was 41.7 degrees Celsius, almost 42 degrees Celsius, right? And he didn't have any signs of heat injury. 
So that's the first message I want to give to you. This idea that you get hit injury above 40 degrees uh, uh, is not true all the time. Uh, in the next lecture, I will talk about this in more detail. But for now, just, just understand that. The second message I want, you to, I want to bring across to you is this. If you look at the temperature curve of all the 18 runners, the slower your run, the higher your temperature. Meaning that those who can't regulate your temperature well, uh, your body actually slow down your running rate. So temperature regulation uh, uh, is very closely related to endurance performance. All right? You want to be able to perform well in endurance event, you got to train your body to regulate temperature well when you're when you're performing during in those events. Uh, this is an interesting study uh, of the critical core temperature theory. And what critical core temperature theory tells us is that the brain has a temperature threshold where once you cross that threshold, um, you will start to inhibit your physical performance. You will start to induce fatigue. And this is a classic uh, experiment that demonstrated that uh, done by uh, uh, Gonzalez Alonso. So they had seven trained male cyclists who performed, uh, uh, who cycled to exhaustion under 40 degrees ambient temperature on three different experiments, okay? One was they pre-cooled the body to, to a core temperature of 36 degrees, then they start cycling. Two was that was the normal temperature as a control. And the third was that they preheat the body to 38.2 degrees and they start cycling to exhaustion. And four of the six cyclists undertook two additional trials where they use a temperature jacket. They, they, they use a, a, a jacket that has got, that flows water around the body to control how, how quick or how slow the temperature rises. Okay, one was the water was 42 degrees in the jacket. Another one was the water was cool at 19 degrees. All right. And these are the main results. Regardless of the experimental condition, all the subjects were exhausted when their esophageal temperature was about 40 degrees, 40.01, 40.02. And what this suggests is that there's a threshold that the brain doesn't allow you to perform above because once you're above that, uh, it senses that you're going into a, a zone that is physiologically not sustainable, okay? The second, so at that time, you know, they even measured muscle temperature using a, a, a invasive uh, temperature probe into the muscle. All right. Of course, there's in the and and when fatigue occurs, there was it was related to an increase in heart rate and a reduction in the stroke volume. Okay, and this is the the data to show that. So in the three conditions: pre cooling, control, uh, uh, and then preheating. And this is their performance time. This is the, is look at this. Regardless of the temperature, this is esophageal temperature. All of them got exhausted at the same temperature consistently. This was the mean skin temperature. Even the skin temperature is about the same. The heart rate also was uh, uh, reached the same threshold, right? Suggesting that there is a relationship between temperature and performance. Now, in this case, uh, it's the same three condition, uh, where, but the axis here is body temperature. So as temperature goes up, you see heart rate going up uh, linearly. At the same time, you see cardiac output dropping and stroke volume dropping. Okay, And this corresponded with the point when, when uh, at this point, when all of them go into a state of exhaustion. This is for the other uh, four subjects who underwent the additional trials. So the same thing, if you look at esophageal temperature, whether the, the water that's, that's circulating around their body was 42 degrees or 19 degrees, they all fatigue at about the same temperature. All right, and same thing, the heart rate, that corresponded with a plateauing, a sharp increase in plateauing of the heart rate, uh, although the skin temperature was different. Why? Because the, 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 the water was right next to the skin. So there was conductive heat exchange uh, with the skin. But in terms of temperature and heart rate, uh, it, it tells the same story of a critical core temperature. Okay, let me, uh, maybe before I go on to the last section about heat acclimatization uh, to finish off today, 
maybe uh, Tintin, do you, is it okay we take question because it's quite a lot of information. Yeah, okay. We can take uh, the question, no problem. Uh, this is half uh, one question from Malaysia. Mr. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, from Malaysia. I think his right hand. Uh, Mr. Yan Seng Kwan, you are here. Hello, from University of Malaysia, uh, Mr. Yan Seng. He is asking about if sweat dripping off is in inefficient in reducing body temperature. What about wiping sweat of ourselves, ourselves during sport? Yep. Will wiping sweat off before it evaporates be counterproductive to reducing our temperature? Yeah, it's, it's the same as sweat dripping off. Yeah, whether you wipe or you you the sweat drip off. The the point is, if it's not evaporated, then you don't lose any heat. Yeah, and you lose water from from the blood volume from plasma. Okay, uh, Mr. Yan Sheng, Yan, is it clear? Uh, I I don't know. Is it clear? Okay. Okay, right. said, thank you. Okay, okay, thank you. Maybe any else question? Uh, Mr. Adrian, okay, please. Okay, you can, Mr. Adrian, you can directly to asking. Yes, hello, Fabian and Ibu Titin. Yeah. Hello. Nice to hello. Join nice this, to this, I'm not seeing uh, your face. You can, on, you can on your camera. I will on, but sometimes the Wi-Fi stops. Hello. But okay. <laughs> Good yeah. to see you. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, it will be not for long. Otherwise, my Wi-Fi will stop. Okay. <laughs> so your wife or your Wi-Fi? <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, I like to ask uh, Fabian about yes. your first uh, diagram that mentioned 80% evaporation. When mm. is that? You you remember your diagram? Yeah, I remember that. The we, number we... 80%. Yes. Because I think when we are in the room, just suitable, we lost by radiation the most, not by evaporation. So can you clarify the first uh, question for me? Yeah, sure. So 80% uh, is the general general figure used uh, when you exercise in a dry environment. Yeah, uh, and that's because of body surface, because, uh, because we, we sweat over a large body surface, and therefore you get a large surface uh, available for heat exchange or rather for heat loss through evaporation. Now, when you're in a room, uh, it also depends on the on the moisture level in the room um, and, and the, temp, uh, uh, um, temperature, the temperature of the air in the room. So when you're in an air-conditioned room, for example, because air condition don't just cool the air, it dries the air as well. Majority of the heat loss is still by evaporation. And the, and the reason is quite simple because of the large body surface area that you're able to sweat. And therefore you have a lot of a huge surface for exchange with the with the environment. Um, because of the, I, I can't explain physics very well, but the movement of heat through radiation, unless it's propelled by wind. So you have a very strong wind wind flow, for example, if the wind speed is very high, then then you're able to lose quite a lot of heat through uh, uh, convection. But otherwise, with no added wind, with no added wind, right? Uh, the amount is still limited. I have, my understanding is convection is only about five to ten percent in in a state of when there's no strong wind. So when you're doing experiments or cyclists, uh, um, convection will be something to bear in mind. Yeah, and that's provided the temperature of the air is cool, much cooler than the skin. I hope I answer your question, Ajanto. Uh, so, so when you don't exercise, 
it's still uh, by evaporation you said oh no and no. when you so, sit in the room yeah no so when you no so so in the resting state is by radiation maybe okay, radiation okay. if yeah, you have a okay. fan blowing then of course it's convection okay okay but it, uh, that's the figure 80 percent is during exercise, during exercise. Yeah? that's right because of sweating okay my yeah. second question is about your curve for uh, the runners who exceed 40 uh, Celsius until yep. 42 or something like that. Mm, yes. And they, what's the connection with the Gonzalez experiment when they have fatigue? They don't ah, show okay. the fatigue at that time? Okay. Or the, it's the, another measure? No. Uh, the, the difference is this, the difference between lab experiment and uh, field experiment, you see. So in my case, they were running a half marathon. Yes. So even though the, the temperature was rising, in a, in, a, in a road race, you're able to adjust your pace accordingly. Yeah. You get what I mean? So yes. that itself calibrates heat production. And that's why... The, the, the faster your, your temperature rises, uh, the slower your pace will be because you're allowed to adjust that. Whereas in lab experiments, yes, yeah. uh, the pace is driven by, by the protocol of the experiment. Yeah. And therefore, therefore uh, is externally driven. That's, that's number one. Number two is that the the core temperature threshold, the critical core temperature threshold would differ between different uh, population. So in our case, you know, it's not homogeneous. You have very highly trained runners, average trained runners and lowly trained runners. And in these three groups, the, the threshold for critical core temperature would differ as well. Whereas in the Gonzalez experiment, uh, it was a homogeneous group. They are all well-trained cyclists. So therefore, their critical core temperature threshold will be about the same. So if you look at the three graphs, right? Mm -hmm. Within that three graphs, each of the three graphs, they would have about the same uh, critical core temperature, but not between the graphs because of the different state of train. Okay, so it's the critical core temperature that is yeah. different yeah in the yeah. experiments okay that's right yeah thanks a lot thank you thank you thank you dr adrianta for uh, supporting okay professor lim kwan hai welcome uh, th thank you thank you very much uh, uh professor fabian can i ask a question now <laughs> certainly yes, certainly yes yeah yes all right first question is like uh when you talk about uh, body heating and all that is it actually sport drink can help? Mm -hmm. Okay. From, ah. from temperature regulation point of view, uh, like I said earlier, drinking doesn't really affect your, your, your body temperature regulation, contrary to what has been published all along. <laughs> ah, that, in the last like 30 our, years, yes. Yeah, in a the, lot of people say sport drink is actually yeah. helping in no. terms of... So, yeah. Okay, so if you're comparing sports drink and water... Yeah, the effect is not. There's no difference in terms of temperature regulation. The difference is energy. Sports mm. drink gives you energy, and water don't. So that's that's the main difference in in giving uh, uh, sports drink versus water. Mm. And that energy itself is important for performance. Mm -hmm. yeah. I see. Okay. Number number two is actually very quick one. The the question is uh, talking about uh, you know we always using a cool tower to you know put the. So, uh, from from your experience, which part of the body part is actually that mean to cool down the body? Let's say the athlete in the running a marathon or they so that they can cool down faster. Which body part? Uh, the the basic principle is body surface. The larger body surface, the quicker is the heat transfer. Mm. So I would for the the upper body front and back would be the biggest largest body surface. Right, okay. so this is one principle. The second thing is you got to be when you come talk about localized cooling, uh, you got to be careful about uh, one of the problem with localized cooling is this. Let's say I cool at my carotid, 
over here, yeah. right? It's very close to my blood vessels, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Because of the localized cooling, the blood that's flowing through there is, will be cooler. Yeah. And you may be sending the wrong message to the brain. <laughs> you know what I mean? The brain will yeah. think that yeah. the body is cooler than, than the body actually is because you're, you're cooling only one spot that's very near that's very near to the blood flowing to the brain. Mm. So that's why rather than, than this old concept of cooling near to blood vessels, the, the, the preferred concept is cooling based on body surface. The larger the body surface you can cool, the better. So firstly, have a big piece of towel <laughs> yeah, to cover as, as, as large a surface as possible and the torso, the upper and lower, front and back of the upper torso, you know, front and back of the upper body would, would be the best. Okay. All right. Maybe next one is uh, talking about adaptation of the heat. Um, how long normally people to take to adapt to the situation? Yeah. Let's say I'm competing in, in certain country where it's very cold yeah. and very hot. And yeah. how, how long? So heat, uh, I'm, that's the next section of my talk. Uh, oh. uh, the, the adaptation starts in, 40, in, in four days, but it's, and it's completed in about 10 to 14 days. Hmm. Yeah. So it starts at, after the fourth day, your body starts to adapt. But the, the, the process of adaptation is finished at about 10 to 14 days, depending on your programs and so on. Oh, yeah. okay. Uh, but just, just now, another question is like, uh, maybe just now you talk about, uh, you know, cooling, cooler environment is always better in terms of performance. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, Malay, Malaysian athlete or maybe Singapore athlete, they go to cold country. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, similarly, correct, correct. you know how to perform. <laughs> yeah, actually, actually, if let's say if it's cool, let's say you're going to a, a running in a in a, a weather, say fifteen degrees to about twenty degrees, it's actually perfect for us mm. because uh, we are used to the to the heat and our, our our cardiovascular system can adapt to that better. But if you're going to a, a run it, to be running at about four or five degrees, right? That's when you're going, you're exposed to very high level of cold stress. You yeah. can also adapt to the cold. There's opposite adaptation. There's cold adaptation as well, cold acclimatization. Uh, and it's cheaper to acclimatize to the cold because in the heat, you need a chamber that costs a million dollars. In the cold, you, in the cold, you dump the person in ice water. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, no, this is how it's done. Yeah. So you can adapt to the cold as well. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Professor you. Lim Pon Hoi. Thanks. <laughs> thank thank you. you also. You're asking your student to join in this lecture. Any else question? Okay. Uh, so you you said before in the graphic half about the about uh heart rate, right? So when when the temperature high, the heart rate also high. Yep. So what is the other parameter to know that this uh, this person get his stroke? So they can like prevent. So you need to drink after this. Maybe have some signal. Yeah. So, so uh, that that's a topic for my next. Part two, yeah, because okay. I'll talk about the, the <laughs> mechanisms of heat exhaustion and, and heat stroke, and then you know what, what you can do to, to prevent them. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, um, heat exhaustion is, is very much related to the picture I showed you about fluid intake, about the effects of exercising the heat on the cardiovascular system rather than a heat problem. In fact, I don't think there's such a thing as heat exhaustion. Yeah, you, you collapse in the heat not because your body is too hot. You collapse in the heat because your cardiovascular system cannot sustain that performance. Because uh, patients of heat exhaustion, their body temperature is still in a very friendly, friendly level, 39, 40 degrees. Mm -hmm. You play a game of soccer mm -hmm. long enough, you get 39, 40 degrees. And mm -hmm. I showed you just now, the runners could tolerate 40, 42 degrees without a problem. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Professor Fabian in here also have the Chief Associate of Indonesia, Indonesian Physiology, yes, uh, Dr. Imelda from University of Indonesia. Yes, I met Dr. Imelda before. Yeah, in Kobe? <laughs> uh, no, yeah. no, in Jakarta when we went for the, the, the medical school quiz. Yeah. 
Oke, okay. Dr. Imelda, you can asking directly. He ask asking something. Oke. Okay. Are you there? Oh, 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 he can. Oke, okay, so I will read for you. Hi, Dr. Fabian. This is Imelda from UI. I have a question. Is there any difference between male and female in temperature regulation? What about climate difference? Um, okay, thank you. Um, there has been several studies done on that, but uh, in terms of male and female, the difference in temperature regulation is not so much due to uh, the physiology, but due to the body surface, due to the body composition. Because the females have, for the same body weight, the females have less muscles than the males. And if you're performing at the same VO2 max, percentage of VO2 max, the females produces less metabolic heat than the males for every minute. Because the less muscles, you, you know, your body weight is lower, right? Yes. So in that, in that sense, uh, it is more due to, to, to body composition than to the mechanisms, the physiological mechanisms of regulating uh, body temperature. Yeah. yeah, and then he, she asking also, is there any epigenetic difference? No, not that we know of. So this has been studied as well, and nobody has been able to identify Uh, specific genes or epi, you know, uh, epigenetic factors uh, that would predispose one to uh, heat injury. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. okay. So this is at five. So you want to continue? Uh, maybe, maybe or you want to stop? Yeah. Okay. Maybe this is a good time to, to stop because mm -hmm. what I've done so far is to for this part is to talk about the basic physiology and the basic concepts of thermal regulation and heat tolerance. Our next part, we'll talk about heat adaptation mm -hmm. and heat yes, injury. Yes. So oh, next part is the, is the application part where we talk about heat injury and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure we have time to talk about fluid balance and you know, fluid management. Uh, if not, we can always have another talk separately. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that... This is a good point. So, any else? Yeah, Dr. Agus. Dr. Agus, okay. Welcome. Okay. Dr. Agus. Uh, it's not a question, Professor Fabian. Yes. Just a remark uh, okay. from the history. Yes. Uh, the ancient Greeks are right. During the ancient Olympic Games, the athletes were totally naked. And they... <laughs> <laughs> you are very Because right. They, they can <laughs> lose <laughs> well, the body uh, heat, <laughs> yeah. and they increase their uh, exercise performance. I think it is so. Well, uh, uh, I'm not sure what exactly is the reason for 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 competing the new. Oh, the reason. <laughs> but but I, I think that the heat part is incidental. <laughs> It's a byproduct. <laughs> yeah. They probably It's have other product. reasons. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. It's probably that. Other you know, reasons, right? <laughs> yeah, other reasons or cultural or whatever. Yeah, I'm not so clear about the reasons. Yeah, yeah cultural. Uh, yeah. And but, rituals, I think, yeah. <laughs> but really, there's a long, there's a, there are thousands of years of history uh, on dealing with heat. And next next yeah. talk, I will share with you uh, some of the historical records of, of when it was first recognized and so on. It goes back to the to the uh, BC, BC era. The first record of it is actually in the Bible, in the Old Testament. <laughs> yes. That's how long ago it's recorded. Yeah. Thank you very much. Very nice. Thank you Indeed. very much. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Ragus, it's a very good question. And for, actually, this topic is a very interesting topic. Yeah, it And, is. Yeah. Because in Indonesia also, Indonesia, Singapore, the weather maybe okay. is look like the same. So, and in here last time have like a marathon in Bandung? Yes. A 2000, I forget 2000, but I mm. forget that also have uh, injury. His stroke also have a death. So many mm. death in there. Yeah. And maybe so we need to make something how about uh, how to 
signal. So if the condition the condition is not good enough, more high, what much you do? I think we need to do like make some this one. Yeah. If someone yeah. do marathon or something, usually like a marathon, they have so many hit stroke. Yeah. So this is where um, the, you know, like, like medical directors of, of race events, mm -hmm. um, there are international mm -hmm. guidelines. Like I said, some of it, the problem is because of the way it's been taught in the last 50 years, 100 years. Some of the guidelines are actually based on very old concepts. Um, I'm not, I think the guidelines are relevant, but on top of that, there are other factors other than heat that needs to be looked at. And this is what my, you know, I started doing since my PhD thesis on, on the mechanisms of heat stroke. That there are other non-heat related factors that causes heat stroke. Um, in a way, quite similar to COVID. <laughs> I'll share with you next, next week. Uh, quite similar mechanisms of infections and so on. Yep. And I'll just give you a hint. The problem with heat stroke starts from your intestine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But how to measure the heat uh, from, from rectal? <laughs> oh, no, no. I mean, uh, if you're in a race, during a race, you can't, you can't do that. So this is something that mm -hmm. a lot of people are also thinking, you know, how can I identify the problem before, before it gets worse? And one of the things that a lot of people don't realize that, you know, the, what differentiates heat stroke from the rest of the heat injury is that heat stroke affects the central nervous system. So people who have heat stroke, right? Now, the other heat injury, you, don't, you, you can't die from it. Okay, heat exhaustion and all, you can't die from it. 100% yes. uh, you recover from it. But heat stroke, uh, the difference is that it affects the brain function. Mm -hmm. So from a medical safety point of view, Early detection of uh, decline in mental function uh, is, 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 a, is the most practical way. So people with heat stroke, they are known to be, how should I say, uh, they, they, they talk things that doesn't make sense. Some of them lose the ability to, 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 for direction. They go, they, they go to the wrong places. Mm -hmm. They run in the wrong places. Mm -hmm. That's why you know, they are found in another place later on. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they are, they are mental, they are, uh, compens you know, compromise in mental functions that happens before that. Yeah. So one of the things I'm trying to promote is to tell people that you don't look at heat stroke by looking at temperature. You look at potential onset of heat stroke by looking at mental functions. Yeah. Wow. So physiology, psychology, Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, it's, it's together. a cognitive, yeah. yeah correct. You, yeah, because uh, it, it's, it's reported everywhere. It's, it's recognized medically that the manifestation of heat stroke include uh, behaviors that doesn't make sense. Yeah. Okay. Some of them became violent, you know, they, 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 they basically talk as though they're someone else. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a very interesting topic. Uh, any else question before yeah, we are talk. going to closing the okay, next can I, can I, can I, Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> Professor uh, Fabian <laughs> Lip. Uh, oh my God, <laughs> You are same Lim, so Professor Lim okay. Bon yeah. Hoi. Uh, yeah. I come from the same village. Yeah. Professor, Professor <laughs> Fabian, uh, sorry, hi, hi. sorry. It's okay. I, uh, all right, uh, just now I was so attracted with your 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 terms, like that you say, uh, danger of overdrink. <laughs> I love that part. Can you yeah. explain a little bit that uh, how the athlete that we know that maybe he or she is overdrink? <laughs> yeah. So, so the, the danger of hyponatremia is very easy to detect. When you put on when you put on weight during exercise, ah, okay. So this, so, the, yeah. So if yeah. we we have done experiments where we measure body weight before and after a race, from five kilometers to one hundred kilometer races, mm -hmm. right? And you have people dehydrated up to six percent of body weight. That means if you are seventy kilogram, you have lost about four point two liters of water. Six times seven, yeah, four point two liters of water. And there's no problem with that. And mm. there are people who gain weight. Oh. Uh, yeah, when you gain weight during exercise, it means that you're drinking more than you have lost. Right? Yeah. Okay. And, and these are the people, no, it's clearly shown, these are the people that has a danger of hyponatremia. Mm. So, so, the, so the, the, the thing with hyponatremia is that uh, it's due more to the dilution of 
of your sodium rather than to the loss of sodium. So a lot of people think because you sweat, you're losing sodium. That's not the main cause. The, the, one of the main causes is a loss of sodium. There's also some thinking that maybe your kidney is not functioning well. Uh, it's absorbing more sodium than it should. But, but the main thing that's very consistent is over-drinking of water. Mm. Over-drinking of water, yeah. So uh, another thing is like uh, always uh, uh, when I was with the national athlete, with the Malaysian athlete, when they go overseas, like example, cold country, uh, they always don't feel thirsty. They, they seldom drink, you know, but uh, their core temperature is actually rising. So what is your, your uh, recommendation? Yeah, so there, there are two things, there, there, there are three things that you can do to make sure that, you know, you have enough, uh, you have enough water in the body. Two are naturally given to us <laughs> by our creator. Uh, mm -hmm. The sense of thirst and your urine color. Ah. Okay, so, so I always tell people, you know, no need to expensive equipment. You drink enough to quench your thirst, that's number one. Secondly, you drink enough to maintain clear urine color. Now, this thing about urine color chart, uh, yeah. ye yellowish, mild yellowish, don't use that. Uh -huh. uh, it's nonsense. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's nonsense because yellow is yellow. Once it's yellowish, it means you're dehydrated. Uh -huh. You know, and there's no standardization as how yellow is yellow. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so those are, those are not been proven to be useful and it conceptually is wrong. It's a wrong way to recommend hydration by mm. having different grades of yellow. The moment you're yellowish, you should drink. That's all. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, always, I always tell people, our mother knows how to drink water better than our textbook. Uh, because when, uh, you know, our mother always teaches us, right, look at our urine, oh, so yellowish, we're going to drink more water, right? Uh, so our mother uh, actually uh, teaches us the right thing. So two things, huh? one is thirst, another one is urine color. So urine yeah. color is not accurate when you're taking vitamins or some medication because yeah. vitamin C, vitamin B, they, they color the urine. So if you take supplements or, or, or medication, urine color is not a good idea. So thirst, the, sec, the third one you can use is body weight. Body weight. Yeah. Okay. So, so the consistency of your body weight before and after training, that's important. So before you train, weigh yourself. You know, after uh, you train, you know, drink gradually to gain back the weight. Okay. Like I said, the, the rehydration, the replacement of fluid takes place after, after the training, not during the training itself. During the uh, training itself, drink based on thirst. So you'll be mildly dehydrated during the training. But when you're thirsty, you should drink. But you don't need to... competition? Yeah, it's the same. Uh, during the marathon... You drink when you need to, when you drink when your body tells you to drink. There's no, the old, the old uh, recommendation that you must drink as much as you can tolerate, drink, you know, as much as you can. Those have been thrown up after 20, 30 years of debate. <laughs> been thrown up already, yeah. Okay. So, so the recommendation is drink based on your thirst during the exercise. Yeah. Uh, and then replace the remaining fluid. After the exercise, that's it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another another good. I, I would like to ask. Maybe <laughs> this one is very related. Just now you are talking about when you talk about when people running the heat stroke. I mean, they actually uh, cardiac stress and all that and, and all that. Uh, what happens if let's say the same athlete that carry the same thing then uh, the train in the altitude? What happen? Altitude, you normally lose uh, 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 water. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, uh, because of the the dryness and other physiological effect. Mm. So, so we, when that happens, you, you get a um, because your your blood becomes more concentrated. When that happens, uh, your thirst mechanism will kick in. Mm. Your urine, your your kidney mechanisms, your urine color, and all will show. Mm. So, same thing. No matter whether your sea level or at altitude, uh, you drink to 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 maintain the homeostasis of your thirst mechanisms and your urine, your urine production and mm. urine color. I see. Yeah. Those are naturally given. Those, those, those biomarkers are given by, you know, a design in our body. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Thank, thank you, you. Dr. Agus. Thank, yes. thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Yep.
Uh, Dr. Abus, yes. you want to ask him yes. again? Yeah. Very okay. short. Very short on the, excuse me. Uh, with the fluid replacement, we should not drink water because uh, as I understood, water uh, can cause water intoxication, right? Uh, what kind of fluid we should prefer to drink after the heavy exercise? Pocari okay. sweat or something yeah. like that? Okay. So, uh, water intoxication is the same as what I was talking about, hyponatremia. They are the same thing. Yes, hyponatremia. Uh, yeah, uh, let yeah. me say a dilution of, a dilution of uh, sodium in the blood. So, normally our sodium is about 142 millimol per liter. When it goes down below 130, that's when you can go into a state of water intoxication, hyponatremia. The problem with hyponatremia is not related to drinking of water or sports drink. It's related to the volume of, of water that you drink. So like I said, if you drink more than you lose, right? Yeah. that means you put on weight during exercise. Uh, that behavior itself predisposes. It's failing, to right? Yeah. So you can drink water. That, but if you drink water based on your thirst, you should be... That itself is a protective mechanism against dehydration and against yes. overhydration. Mm -hmm. That's one. So the purpose of sports drink like Pokari, 100 plus, Gatorade, uh, is to replace energy. The, the, the difference between drinking water and drinking those drinks is energy replacement. So you need those kind of drinks when your activity is more than an hour when you need to replace your carbohydrate uh, source because after more than an hour, you know, your carbohydrate level may have dropped. And the purpose is not so much temperature regulation. The purpose is more for physical performance to sustain performance, electrolyte and carbohydrate yes. so that your metabolic system can, can will have enough uh, glycogen to, to sustain the glycolysis and the... Uh, the, you know, crap cycle and so on. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, just for interest sake, there was this, like I said, 20 over years of debate about drinking or not drinking water. And the, the irony is that the debate was not only scientific. It was also one side accusing the other side that those people who were promoting drinking lots of water were sponsored by sports drink companies. Yeah, it, all this came came out in the came out in the scientific literature. Yes. Yeah, yes. and and therefore, uh, after more than twenty years of debate, uh, the the consensus now is that you know water is okay. There's no need to over drink, and you can be mildly dehydrated during exercise. That's fine. And energy drink is useful for the purpose of energy replacement, not so much. Fluid replacement. Yeah. So that's the consensus at this point. Thank you very much, Professor Thank Fabian. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Professor Fabian. Uh, yeah. So is it okay? I still have one question. Yeah, okay. Uh, from Inyoman Sudarmada. Hello, you are there? Okay. He asking about, is there any mechanism of our body to choose which method I use to lose their heat. If there are any mechanism of it, can we improve with training? Thank you. So as I said, the, the, the mechanisms of heat loss are the, the four mechanisms I showed you earlier, the physical mechanisms, radiation, convection, conduction, and evaporation. And for exercise, the primary mechanism is uh, evaporation, okay? Uh, like I said, 80% of heat dissipation comes from evaporation. And the way to, yes, you can. The good news is you can improve that. And the way to improve that is by heat acclimatization. That's the next topic I was going to talk about. <laughs> we will continue with that in part two. I will show you data. Uh, this is something that's very well proven. It can be done by any of you. You don't need special equipment. Mm -hmm. I just, I'm in the middle of a study that, that does heat acclimatization using my natural environment. Mm -hmm. And I'll show you some data of that. I even do heat acclimatization in the night. 
yeah. Uh, this is the first time anyone is trying to hit the acclimatization in the night. Um, and I'll show you very exciting data. So the answer is yes. And there's a very simple process. In fact, all of you can do it. Uh, like I explained you to Dr. Lim just now, it's four to, four to 14 days of, of daily exposure to heat. Yeah. Just get your people to play soccer in the heat for two weeks. And you find that they are, you, when they do the same thing, the temperature is actually lower. Mm. And this is very consistent. For the last 50 years, the data is very consistent. Yeah. We adapt to, to heat. The body can adapt to heat. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Fabian Lim. Okay. So I think we're going to the next session is closing. Okay. So thank you very much. And before, uh, Fia, are you there? So we have taking picture first yes. or, okay, you can give the certificate for Professor Fabian Lim. If, oh, Fabian Lim, yes, correct. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I always Fabian Lim and Professor Lim Bon <laughs> so, uh, Okay, yeah. okay, Fia, you okay. can share. Uh, okay, thank you for Miss Titin and Professor Fabian. And the next, now I will share certificate for speaker. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Oh, so nice of you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, I'm so I'm, I'm so honored to 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 be able to share this information with you and thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry that thank you very much for your excellent presentation in this visiting like uh, professor and I hope for next session is more the topic I think is more hot <laughs> yeah. than this yeah. one. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And then so, Fia and Niels? Next Monday, yeah, the talk, same time, yeah. Okay, oh, Marisa. In here also have a Marisa from Thailand. He said, thank you very much. Oh, Mrs. Ilmerda, now it's Oh, thank out. you, <laughs> yeah. So now we are going to taking picture together. Please turn on your camera. <laughs> okay, don't hide. I'm not seeing you. <laughs> Okay, please turn on your camera and in here still have Dr. Adrianta, Dr. Siti Haryu, Dr. Hardian, Dr. Agus. Oh, the Chief Department of Sports Science in here. Mr. Oh. Sugiarto. Uh, this, okay, uh, because from have a, some meeting. And then please turn on your camera all and we can take picture together. Okay, I'm not see. Uh, Dr. Hadian, I'm not see you. Uh, Professor Sugiarto, I'm not see you. Mr. Surya, call is lovely. Oh, I don't know what happened. Maybe the signal is not good. Okay, one, two, three. This is the part one. Okay. Thank you. One. Not thank yet. you, thank you, Prof. Fabian. <laughs> <laughs> and thank then, you very much. Uh, thank you. Part two. Fabian. Oh, okay. no one opened the camera. What happened? This is <laughs> so many from UP, Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia. Yeah. But all very, but, all very shy. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why they so shy and yeah. not open the camera. Yeah. And then the third. Okay, it's from oh, Mrs. City Bay too. Why are you not coming out? <laughs> so the third and then the fourth. So this is before before is have one eighty two participant and oh. now just eighty four participant until the last uh, six. Uh, yeah, 5.30. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yes, yeah. It's 84 should get a certificate for staying behind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, what happened? Why I cannot take it? Okay. I think the next one we need to make a collaboration research about the measurement. Uh, maybe the heat stroke, how to prevent yeah. the athlete not to get the heat stroke. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you all participants and thank you thank all seniors. Thank you, Dr. Fabian. Thank you, yeah. good to see you. Thank you. Yeah. Good to thank see you, Imelda. Thank you, Prof. Fabian Lee. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, yep. Thank you, Prof. Yep. Fabian Lee. Okay, I hope to see everyone on Monday, next Monday. Yeah, yeah. another, that's part two. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thank you. See you. All right, thank bye -bye. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye. Thank you. Sami -sami. Oh, that's good. This one. Jangan lupa diisi ya formnya, diisi nama lengkapnya untuk dapat sertifikat. Langsung ke email tanpa ada perangko. Langsung, langsung ke email. Matosuun, Setoyo, terima kasih Via. Dokter Agus Matosuun, saya suka itu. Sun. Wah, backgroundnya keren. Kayaknya nanti kalau pandemi berakhir perlu naik gunung salak sananya. Nah ya gitu ya. Uh. Ini rumah saya bangun sendiri nih. Oh uh, keren banget dok. Mm -mm. Empat setengah bulan. Mm -mm. Wow, so fast. Mm -mm. Cepat ya dok. Keren. Cepat. Mm -mm. Supply chain-nya yang cepat itu. Jadi tidak nunggu-nunggu tukangnya. Belanja sendiri. Wah, kayaknya perlu dicontoh ini. Nah, sudah tua, jangan. Kalau sudah tua, stresnya levelnya tinggi. Bikin rumah. Berarti ya. harus dari muda dulu ya. Uh, ya dokter, dari muda sudah bikin. Saya lupa tadi. Dokter Emrita Ilyas belum saya sebutkan. Oh my God. Nyon Pangapun. Dokter Emrita sudah, sudah pergi mungkin. Iya, ya. lupa tadi dok. Sampai ketemu lagi ya. Iya, Matu Suwon sangat sedoyo. Terima oh, kasih. Ya. Selamat berbuka ya. puasa dan selamat berbuka puasa. Kita jumpa lagi minggu depan setelah Lebaran. Ya, salam sehat semua ya. ya salam okay. sehat. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hmm. Waalaikumsalam. Oke. Okay.